Okay, welcome back. We're at the uh, part of the Weather and Climate Summit now, which is kind of fun. It allows for interaction between the online audience and uh, the speakers that you saw this morning. We'll do this uh, today, tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday. So we hope that you get engaged with the presentations and that you feel uh, compelled to ask questions if you are curious. Also, the uh, weather uh, meteorologists, the TV broadcast meteorologists that are in the room are also tweeting out asking their viewers to submit any questions. So we'll start with the room. I'm going to move the microphone around to anybody who has one. Whoever has one, uh, raise your hand up and I'll bring the microphone to you and uh, then we'll get started. Uh, right here on my right is uh, Dr. David Titley who just spoke uh, on climate change and national security uh, issues. And on my left, uh, your right, is Dr. Bill LaPenta who is director of the National Centers for Environmental Prediction uh, for NOAA. So I'll step out of the picture and we'll move the microphone around the, uh, around the room, see if anybody has any questions. And while people are thinking and looking at their feeds, since I'm hosting, I get to ask the first question. Um, this is for um, Dr. Titley. Uh, Dave, what do you see as the biggest challenge in um, climate change and national security? How do we move forward on things that people see as a crisis? For example, sea level rise along the coastline. Um, because while it might not be a problem today and might not be a problem tomorrow, uh, like a new satellite, we better be thinking about that problem and, and moving, you know, moving forward so we can address it. So what's the biggest challenge? I think the, uh, the, the biggest challenge uh, from the security perspective right now, and, and others may certainly disagree with me, but I would say the changes in the Arctic. Uh, how do we deal with the Arctic, especially as it most likely opens up seasonally? How much trade ends up coming through there? How do we deal with Russia, especially in light of recent events of the past year? Uh, while we were in the break, I was, uh, I was talking to some colleagues here, and you know, Russia has 50% of the coastline of the Arctic. They have about 21% of their GDP comes from north of the Arctic Circle. 19% of their population live north of the Arctic Circle. They are an Arctic nation. So how in this time do we deal with them? So that's, I would say, the near-term issue. I would say the intermediate-term issue is most likely uh, the sea level rise and how we deal with this both from a foreign and a domestic uh, point of view. The security aspect is going to be just one. The Navy is going to be just one of the stakeholders, uh, not only Department of Defense and other agencies, but really our towns, and especially in sort of the hot spots of sea level rise. So I would say those are the two. There's a couple wild cards, but but let's let's just stop there for right now. Thank you. That sounds great. Do we have anybody else, John? John Morales. So John Morales again from uh, NBC in Miami, and uh, I'll just relay concerns. Uh, uh, from my audience, uh, things that I see, generally speaking, when I uh, post things on social media, and, and you'd be surprised how surprised my audience is every time I post a three-foot inundation map of what it might look like in South Florida with three feet of, uh, of additional sea level rise. And they're all shocked. Every, every time I put it, there, there seems to be new folks that are shocked as to what that might look like. As you know, also, at the local level, there's uh, quite a bit of work going on, uh, where, where, whereas the Southeast Regional Climate Compact, which includes the four counties down there from Palm Beach all the way to Monroe, or, for example, the city of Miami Beach itself, planning for the year 2060, there's a lot of local work being done. But uh, to the question, how do we um, look at the varying ranges of projections long-term for sea level rise? Because they go anywhere from a linear continuation of the eight inches or so we've seen over 100 years, all the way to what our national climate assessment, uh, which was released uh, last year, uh, says could be as high as six feet. What should our folks in southeast Florida look at in terms of uh, what we can count on in terms of sea level rise by 2060 or 2100? Let me, let me just take a, a brief shot at that, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Bill to see if he's, he's got any, anything to add. Uh, this is almost kind of a classic risk management approach. 
in which you see there's some changes, but you really are not sure sort of what the tails, what the edges are. Uh, so if I talk to my engineering friends, you know, how do you design at the beginning, let's say structures that would be good for, let's say, five, six, seven feet, but how do you build them so you don't have to build it all at once? Maybe you, you build the foundation so that if I need to get up to there, I can do it, as opposed to saying, oh shoot, you know, I really had to go with a completely different design. But for the first part, maybe I just build it to three feet, and then I watch the, you know, it sounds simplistic, but I watch the tide gauge, and I start plotting it on a projection, and I say, okay, so which one of those projections is kind of, kind of working out there? So I can, do a little bit, I see a little bit, probably if I wanted to be a contractor and get a lot of money out of this, I'd call it a ba Bayesian approach. Uh, but I would just kind of call it also maybe, maybe just sort of a common sense way of spend no more money than you have to, but sort of begin at the beginning with the worst case in mind, but don't build it all at the, at the same time. But I'll, I'll, let me, let's see if, if Bill has any comments on the, this. The only thing I'll add to that is that I think that's a very reasonable approach to risk mitigation, right? You, you're, you're investing what you can, and then you're watching what the trends are, and then you adjust to those trends. So I think that's a very reasonable approach. Howard Burton again in Washington and WUSA. One thing that I've noticed, and I haven't done any studies, and I ask, have any studies been done on the number of coastal flood advisories or coastal flood warnings that are, are going up, because I see it a lot more in parts of the Chesapeake Bay or the tidal Potomac, just observationally. And I'm wondering if either of you gentlemen has any knowledge of that. So from the Weather Service side, I don't have any specific knowledge of right. that. Right. Does anybody track the number of coastal flood advisories warnings that are being issued? But just because I don't doesn't mean that it's not being tracked. But we could, that's a very good question. I can certainly look into that for you. It's probably in, you know, I'm, I think you can get that from my NOAA days. You can, you can go back into the database. It's a very answerable question. Uh, that one slide I had of the flooding in the Norfolk neighborhood would, uh, would, would support your, your qualitative, you know, observation that, yeah, they're probably getting, getting more as, as uh, time goes on. Thanks, Howard. Um, Jim White, University of Colorado again. The, um, one of the interesting challenges that you, both of you have talked about uh, with this whole problem is the time frame. You, people need to be thinking far more than the next three months, far more than the next year, 10 years, in many cases, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, we don't seem to do that all that well. Do you, do you have any advice for how we might uh, refocus on that? You talked about that being the adult way to think, um, but clearly we struggle with that. And I think that that's a real key problem we have today. I, I see it happen where people need to. And it's not just the federal government by any means. So I've, I've worked at, at some length uh, with some of the folks who are redesigning the San Francisco uh, water and sewer system. And they are really trying to think a century out. They're really looking at sort of soup to nuts. What is the sea level rise going to be? What kind of water am I going to have to be putting through this system? You know, where, where should I put my pumping stations? What kind of of abnormal or extreme events should I have? So I see the folks who are putting investments in there, to the degree they can, they, I think more and more they realize those are the questions they should be asking. You know, now the answers are, are not easy, uh, but I see that. And, and I think, you know, how do we have to get every single person in America to be thinking like 50 years out? I'm, I'm not sure that's needed. Uh, but it's sort of the folks who have either because of their, either their private sector position or their government position to sort of think out because they own infrastructure or they own policies, uh, they, need, they need to understand that we just can't, you know, due diligence is no longer just looking at the last 100 years of records, adding 10% for safety and then, and then going on. And Bill? And just to add to that, I think Dave touched on it in his talk, it's about leadership. And you know, in the government right now, I like the trend that I see within the Weather Service and within NOAA. I think, I think we're moving forward in the right direction. We're thinking more strategically, perhaps, than we have in the past. But the challenge is to build that into your business processes so that no matter who's at the helm, the organization maintains that kind of stability and outlook. We're going to have a new administration in a couple of years. Um, we have no idea what's going to happen at the leadership levels of NOAA. So while everything is well aligned today, and I'm very optimistic, 
two years from now in the government, it's going to be difficult to, to know what that environment is going to look like. So my point is that in the government, you know, we have short time scales uh, to really make changes. And it's difficult sometimes to build a true leadership team that's going to stay on board through the long, long term to actually implement a significant change. Let me just follow very quickly up onto Bill's part. In the Department of Defense, what they do is they build a five-year budget projection. So we have, the Navy has like 30-year projections for their ships and for their aircraft, but they actually are starting to put money out five years in advance. So you really see the interest coming up at, that, at those points. Not every agency does that, and I would encourage more long-term budget programming, not just living in what we call the execution year. Uh, and agencies who live there, they, they know who they are. So they need to be able to start putting money out in the future, and that, that tends to focus the mind. Thanks. Jim Cantori, Weather Channel. Uh, Bill, this question's for you. You mentioned, I think, earlier how the media has driven the, the four runs of of the GFS, especially the alternate 6Z and 18Z. Maybe we should ask that question again, uh, especially given the success of the high resolution models and obviously the need for horsepower. I, I think that's a fair question. And in fact, the Weather Service field offices have been asking that question for the last couple of years. And I think what we have to do is my experience in Weather Service, when you try to turn something off, I think it was the NGM I, I, that was turned off in like 2009 or something like that because there were a couple of users that relied on that system in their day-to-day -day operations. But that doesn't mean we can't try to make changes in the production suite. We have to articulate what the cost, you know, the pros and cons are. And I think if we're aggressive in articulating that and, and soliciting feedback, we could perhaps make some radical changes in the production suite to meet, again, you know, mission requirements. So the field asks that all the time. And uh, I think everything should be on the table uh, strategically. I, I could say it's not just the NSEP, the Weather Service, that has trouble turning things off. When I ran the Navy's equivalent uh, a decade ago, we had a couple of old legacy products from the 60s. And my god, I mean, it took me almost two years to, to, to kill them. And it is. It's just a bureaucratic thing. But, but you have to do it, because if you don't do it, you never free up the resources to get ahead. <laughs> uh, John Morales again from Miami. Uh, speaking of bureaucratic uh, things, um, two months ago at the um, uh, ICEWIG meeting, uh, Environmental Information Services Working Group, it's a, a working group of the NOAA Science Advisory Board, we had a couple of staffers uh, from uh, the Senate come in and um, address the group and look for, uh, they look for feedback regarding a weather bill that uh, may be written uh, in the Senate uh, during this new Congress coming up uh, this year. A different version of the weather bill, completely different from the Congress's version, which uh, completely ignored climate uh, altogether. Uh, and we were told by these staffers that uh, that version of, of, of a weather bill was a non-starter in the Senate because of that, because of that reason. Uh, so I, I guess this question is for you, uh, uh, Dr. Lapenta. What, what's the National Weather Service expecting, perhaps, regarding that bill in light of the NAPA study, in light of the National Academy's um, uh, becoming second to none uh, report? What might this mean for the Weather Service long term? Well, I think in terms of what the Weather Service is doing in responding to those community reports, uh, we haven't deviated from that in the last couple of years. So I think we're moving forward with that information. We're heading in the right direction. As far as legislation, potential legislation, you know, we're aware of it. We know that there are a lot of people that are involved in that process. And, you know, we, we don't have any influence over that, obviously. But I do believe that the fact that they're looking at it and, and whether it's being talked about, I think is a positive development. Uh, whether or not that becomes law and what that law is, if it's too prescriptive, that could be a problem. But if it really helps align perhaps the weather infrastructure and resources in this country, I think that could be a positive thing. We'll just have to see how it plays out. I have an online question uh, for Dr. Titley. Um, how big or not big of a role do you see uh, desalinization playing in climate change mitigation? That's, uh, I think it really comes down to, so how is the energy 
uh, driven by those and what is the cost of that energy. So if you can produce, let's say, uh, energy sources that are cheap, I would argue non-carbon, that can, can produce that competitively, that's, that's pretty good. But in general, desalinized water is really expensive compared to water from sort of, I'll call it natural uh, type sources there. So, and you start looking at the scale of, you know, it kind of gets into, not to sound all green and everything, but ecosystem services. It's amazing how much water we get just from the regular hydrologic cycle. And when you start trying to replicate that with desalinization, you know, you realize how big the ecosystems are and how small we are and how expensive it becomes. So it could, again, become part of, let's say, a portfolio. There could be some places, and there are some places already, in which that really becomes the most cost-effective solution. But does it become sort of this large global solution? I, I'm not sure. Uh, but I do know that without some really revolutionary breakthroughs, uh, those, there's a lot of cost involved. Yeah, uh, Howard Bernstein again. Bernadette Woods is uh, apparently watching the stream from Climate Central. So she sent me a link. Hi, Bernadette. Hi, Bernadette. And just so you know, the nuisance flooding is an increasing problem. This goes back, I believe, 60 years or something in uh, Baltimore, Washington, and Annapolis. And some of these places have, are in the top 10, and some of them have seen an increase of 925% in the amount of nuisance flooding. So I'm going to tweet out that link, and I'll hashtag the uh, WCX, WXCS 2015 if anybody wants to look at that link. I, I think that's, that's consistent with the numbers that I put up for that, that uh, uh, neighborhood in the in the Hague, and yeah, you get these really big percentages because you're starting with a very low base number. Uh, so, but yeah, but but irrespective, that's a it's a pretty significant number. All right, I, uh, Brad Panovich, uh, NBC Charlotte. I, this is a question for one of my viewers, and I think we kind of talked about this earlier. Uh, wants to know why the global model seemed to fall behind the European in regards to accuracy, and what are we doing to close that gap? So the bottom line is that we're, we're putting more resources towards the global models in the last couple of years. It's going to take a couple of years to realize that in terms of operational benefits. Increasing the resolution, paying attention to the data simulation system, and the investment that we've made in operational compute capacity uh, for NOAA, I think, is going to help make that global system better than it is today. And just as a user of these, I'm, I'm no longer work for the government or, or anything, but as a user, what I would like to see is very competitive models from at least the U.S. and NOAA uh, in Europe and maybe one or two other sources. And then if you truly have very competitive but independent multi-models, you know, the, the next piece of the research is how do you put those together? So if you're a, a line forecaster in whatever, public-private sector, you get an answer that is frankly better than anything that any one of those models can produce. And uh, you know, but you got to have good models. You can't have sort of the weak stepchild in yeah. there. And, and, but that's pretty an exciting. And project. I personally, I feel like the GFS gets a bad rap, and it actually does fairly well. I just think what happens is we highlight the negatives of one model, and we kind of ignore the negatives of the other quite often. Yeah, but GFS, there was, what was it, two weeks ago, there was a potential coastal event which the GFS consistently kept way off the coast, the Europeans had, you know, big, big snowstorm for the Northeast. I think it about, and they were consistent, like day eight to day five or day four, they were consistent, and then, ah, never mind. Yeah. You know, there wasn't a hue and cry in Congress of why is the GFS better than the Europeans. They're, they're just, I, I, ne I didn't hear that hue and cry. Uh, but, you know, we all know. I mean, we all do forecasting in this room, and it counts, you know. Yeah. You be, be right on the forecasts that count. And, and that's I almost feel like some forecasters, they have this negativity towards it, and they discount it sometimes to their own detriment. Um, and I, 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 I mean, with the upgrade this year, I was telling Jim this, I feel like the, the GFS upgrade has done much better than the European model this winter season so far, especially on the East Coast. So, so the fact that we're talking about this, perceptions are important. Yeah. And forecasters, any, any time you use a tool, you have a perception about that tool. And it's up to us to communicate and inform that, you know, look at the GFS, look at it's not as bad as everybody thinks it is, but at the fact that people are talking about it, the fact that so many people were looking at the parallel, you know, and it's not just the weather service, it's, it's you and the community that are looking at it, and you're telling us, hey, Noah, you're heading in the right direction. So you're getting confidence in it. 
And by you saying it out loud in public places, other people are listening and saying, hey, maybe I need to look at that in a different light. Maybe I need to look at that a little more carefully than I have in the past. It's not my job to sit here and criticize the European Center model or the UK Met model or anything. My job, I influence what I can in terms of what NOAA has to offer. However, the fact that we're looking at things systematically, and even the forecasters in the Weather Prediction Center have noticed the trend lately that the GFS has been outperforming the European Center, but we just don't go out and broadcast it. But what's happening is they're getting more confidence in that tool, and that's what we want to have happen in this country. Hi, Crystal Leiser, KMBC News in Los Angeles. Um, I have some Twitter questions, and I think a few might be watching. So what people would like to know at home, uh, obviously we have a significant drought. We've had some soggy weeks in December. We have a huge uphill battle ahead of us. A lot of viewers want to know what your take is on the California drought, the future of the drought, and any message you may have for people who live in California. I've uh, you know, I'll, I'll fall back to that quote I used earlier from Niels Bohr that predictions are tough, especially when they're about the future. Uh, my crystal ball is no better than anyone else's as to what the future is. But, but I think the, it, it's great if you're mag if that your viewers sort of understand the magnitude of the drought. So even with those very significant rains last month, yes, they were good. Yes, they really helped the reservoir. But, man, it's a deep hole to fill up. What, what I will say, though, is you know, what the climate projections do show is that, in general, the subtropics, you know, kind of central southern California, unfortunately, will over time tend to dry out. You know, up north, you know, it might even get wetter. And somewhere it, it switches in there. So is this, you know, I, again, I just get very cautious on the attribution. And I know people are some are much more forward out there and others are not so, but it is unfortunately consistent with a changing climate. So then how do we adapt? How do we make things work? And that's really a, a, a conversation for, for Californians to, uh, to engage in. Uh, so uh, one of the questions that I have here uh, for Dr. Lepenta, what are the biggest challenges of environmental model development over the next 10 to 20 years, could you summarize some of your thoughts on that? So one of the things I talked about in my talk is the fact that we're going towards a holistic coupled Earth system modeling framework, which means you're coupling the atmosphere with the ocean, with the land, with the ice, and you're also including more detailed and complex processes like aerosols, for example. And when you go down that path, you also have to worry about coupled data simulation because you have to have initial states for all those different, different components of the environment. So that's, that's a big challenge there. And also the um, high-performance computing. Uh, what the limiting factor is going to be in the future is the amount of power that it takes to operate those high-performance computers. So those are two of the things that are really looking, to, looking at us straight in the face in terms of you know, operational modeling, per se. The National Academies, as we speak, is uh, doing a study on what they call subseasonal to seasonal forecasting. And I was... Uh, honored to be asked to, to talk to them. And one of the things we talked about is maybe some, some almost revolutionary advances. For example, cloud resolving climate models. You know, and that kind of sounds like pie in the sky. But you kind of hook up the very high resolution, what we call the mesoscale atmosphere, all the way to the climate. And it turns out that like low clouds, especially like off the Pacific coast, impact the climate. And we don't really get those. In fact, we don't even pretend to get them right in explicitly in the climate models. This probably requires exascale computing, so almost another order of magnitude. Uh, it's the power. It's the cooling. Uh, but again, I, I'm pretty optimistic we may get there in maybe 10-ish years or so. And that, to me, is, is pretty, pretty exciting that uh, you know, people don't just come in white jackets and, uh, and try to bundle me out of the room when, when we talk about this anymore. I think there's, there's a possibility, and those could really be, really be revolutionary. I just want to touch on that. So, you know, I look back at my career, you know, in the 80s, what, what we could do then, uh, you know, in terms of guidance, numerical guidance to scale out to five days, what, what we do today is really amazing when you sit back and look at it. I mean, from a a severe weather perspective, we could provide situational awareness five days in advance now. We don't know the exact details, but we're telling the public that 
there is a high likelihood that in five days we could have a severe weather outbreak in this part of the country. And of course, as you get closer in time, you narrow it down. You know, 20, 30 years ago, you know, we could only dream of doing that. So things that we thought were impossible 30 years ago, we're doing on a routine basis today. So the same thing is going to be true for the next 30 years as well. We just don't know exactly what that's going to be. Dr. Titley, Dr. Lapenta, thank you very much. This has been a really engaging internet uh, uh, sort of integrated opportunity to speak with uh, folks online and also here in the room. So we're going to uh, stop the uh, discussion for today so we can head over to lunch and, uh, and get some lunch. For our online uh, viewers, uh, please join us back tomorrow at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time, when we bring uh, to you the director of the National Hurricane Center, uh, Dr. Rick Knab, and also the head of the GOZAR program at NOAA, uh, Greg Mant. We've got some great stuff to show you, and we hope that you uh, uh, join us tomorrow. And please keep the online discussions going, because the questions from you online are, are very important, as well as those uh, from you in the room. So thanks very much, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.